is 5.30. I'll call the meeting to order. Start out with roll call. Alder Ramey? Here. Alder Rust? Present. Alder Heidemann? Here. Alder Decker is here. Alder Salazar is excused. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty, I think we can spell the book of other people here, so maybe we'll do a quick introduction. I guess uh, I'm all the person, Dean Decker, Chair of the Committee, and all the person from District 6. Uh, Joe Heidemann, District 10, the home of uh, Indian Mount Park. Uh, Zach Rice, <laughs> District 8, uh, Vice Chair. I'm Angela Ramey, District 5. Liz Majerus, Assistant City Attorney. What was the Department of Public Works? Kristen Sanchez with Great for working with the city and the company in Slaughter. Okay. Joe Curlin, Department of Public Works. Closest park is Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Sizeman, Department of Public Works. Stacey Westlick, Department of Public Works. Heather Burke, Department of Public Works. David Evil. Public Works Department. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll start out with uh, number five, approval of minutes from August 29th, 2023. I move to approve. Second. Motion being seconded. Any discussion on those minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair will say those are approved. Okay, number six, general ordinance number 19, 23, 24, September 5th. 2023, an ordinance creating a two-way stop requiring northbound and southbound traffic on North 80th Street at Pinge Avenue. Yeah, this is the intersection of North 18th Street and Cambridge Avenue that Heather has up here. Our office received several phone calls, and the reason we see phone calls is because this intersection is, is under control. Therefore, there's no, for some reason, there's, there's no stop signs were ever, ever installed at the intersection. And since I've been here, this has maybe happened a half dozen times in these older neighborhoods. I said, just the stop sign is never involved. Now, we're not going to put up a four-way stop. You don't want to do that. But to make the intersection safer so someone stops, it's not uncontrolled, you should make this a two-way stop, and it should be put on 18th Street because that's, that's the minor street. Less people are going to be inconvenienced from the stop sign on 18th. So... That's how this all came about. I said it's probably happened a half dozen times since I've been here. It's always in these older neighborhoods. Yeah. Just no one's ever, uh, yeah, uh, just had a couple phone calls on it. And you go out there and boom, boom, there is no stop signs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's always been our policy to try to take care of the, the uncontrolled intersection. But it's not a four way stop. That's a whole other thing. Sure. Uh, oh, Angela? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does it warrant a stop sign or a yield sign? And, and I, I just, why, yeah. I live in Wildwood, so mm -hmm. I'm there's I'm not, I we just had got a stop sign put in maybe a couple years ago that should definitely be a yield sign because trust me, no one's stopping anyway. Right. And so I'm just curious if it, uh, yield signs I think are from our from our department is they're good like on roundabouts because you really get at a roundabout. You, a lot of times you don't want to stop, you want to yield, but you can see all the way around you. Something like this where you got sight distance issues. For instance, in these older neighborhoods, a lot of the homes are built really close to the sidewalk. You don't get all these big setbacks. Sure. Like you have in newer subdivisions, you got trees. Granted, there's no sight distance on the, I guess that'd be the east side of the road, but you want to you want a stop sign. You want to put up a, a stop bar or a stop mm -hmm. sign. And just that's, that's just it's just the cleanest way to do it. But. Yield signs do have their place, so it's wrong about especially. <clears throat> Joe, do do yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, then I guess I'm looking for one. Second. Maybe second. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. All right. Number seven. Resolution number 51-23-24, September 5th, 2023. A Resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract with JT Engineering for design <clears throat> services related to the State Highway 23 and Wheeler Drive intersection. Let's see if we put this good down here a little bit. Oh, well, Ryan, yeah. Ryan. Here we go. Um, this is the intersection of Taylor Drive and State Highway 23. A lot of people call it Erie Avenue, Cole Memorial Drive. But State Highway 23, this section of Cole Memorial Drive is considered a connecting highway. And um, the DOT has a program. 
it's called uh, the Signals and ITS standalone program. So in other words, what they'll do at the at the two interchanges that are there and also down on the bottom, the signals are extremely old, so you apply it to, this, to, to the DOT program. And we signed an S SMA with them a couple of years ago to replace the hardware and do uh, some some minor curve work with the DOT. The DOT has this program, but it's got to be it's got to be part of their their system, which it is. We did the same thing a couple of years ago over at Union and Self Business because Self Business is considered a connecting highway. Or what they the DOT will will um, it's an up, upgrade all the hardware. A lot of this stuff is probably from the 80s or early early 90s. The hardware and they come out look at it. They they realize this stuff's got to be replaced. So the, with this program. Uh, the city basically you have to the city has to hire the designer to see exactly what you all need to upgrade with a camera system and also for the installation with this program the city has to pay the money all front the design work and the construction but then when it's all said and done we get reversed 90 90 percent but, but, with, but with the program though the city's got to basically pay, pay the money up front. it's a good program we're going to use it down on washington avenue and solve business drive I know whenever this comes about, David and I, we always try to chase these programs yeah. down. They're, they're, they're really good. So what, what they'll do is right. these signals, as you see, they have, this, we yeah. just, these called the trombone arms. That's the older standard. You'll have actually a structure that will go across, and you'll have the vertical signals over both lanes now, as you see in some of the newer intersections. Okay. But again, it has to be a connecting highway. And, so, but the first thing you gotta do is you have to get a design done, which that's, that's what this is for. This is strictly for the design contract. And then the construction contract, that will come, that will come like next spring. Okay. Yeah. Cause this is all scheduled to be, uh, be completed by the end of 2024. Anytime we can get the state to pay for something, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Stuff, that's stuff needs it. It's, it's got the loop system where, where the, the loops are underneath the concrete and it's picked up magnetically when cars are there. Nowadays, you want a camera system. It's so okay. much more efficient. More efficient. Yeah. It's just a heck of a lot better system. Mm -hmm. And they and they realize you that. If you drive a motorcycle, that's really not. <laughs> Pardon me? Well, a lot of times with these old systems, these old loops, they don't pick up more pick them up. Yeah, or if you set it, or if you go in there and you adjust the you adjust the loops, they'll pick up everything. You don't yeah. want that either. So <laughs> you, just, you just want to get rid of that stuff. <clears throat> Any discussion on this? I have a question. Yeah. So, is this the, the, the design you're talking about? Is it just for lights, or is it? Is are we changing street at all? There Maybe a little bit of curving, but it's mostly meant for hardware. Okay. Maybe a little bit of curving, but they won't. They won't touch like sidewalk. It really isn't meant a whole heck of a lot for pedestrians. Meant for moving. I mean, yeah, but, the, but there are some pedestrians. Yeah, but they, there. what they'll do, what they'll do, they'll put in the best they can. Then we'll come back. And have sidewalk. Yeah. Buttons and stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. That'll be part of the side. Some of the infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. Promotion then, I guess. I move to approve the resolution. Okay. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 That is approved. Okay. Number eight. Uh, resolution number 522324, September 5th, 2023, your resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to ex execute a lease agreement with Lakeshore Regional Child Advocacy Center for long term use of a portion of the uptown social senior center community center building located at 1817 North 8th, or 8th Street as a branch location. It's uh, Assistant City Attorney Liz is here. She worked on, on the agreement to help, but I'm just this. I'm going to pass this around. This is at the Sheboygan Senior Center, Uptown Social, which okay. you see in the blue. If you pass that around, okay, is the space that they're talking about okay. leasing. So it goes like in this direction. Okay. Okay. So it's like we call it like a gray space, vacant space that wasn't built out at the Sheboygan. Uh, uptown this social is proposed to being built into there. That's what this is discussing. Correct. So uh, the child advocacy center um, is in need of space. Given given that the city used HUD allocation dollars, they were very specific in terms of any type of um, secondary uses. The CAC meets all of those requirements. That's been uh, vetted through HUD and um, we think it's a you know a win-win it serves a great need with their organization and 
they're going to invest in the building by building out this vacant space that we have. And um, in terms of the lease, it's a pretty straightforward lease. It's not a, a profit driving lease. It's really just a, a public service lease. Uh, currently, Lakeshore CAC is utilizing a small space within the police department building. It's inadequate for their needs. Uh, this space is on the bus route, so it provides uh, ready access for individuals who don't have uh, private transportation. Uh, there's no apparent conflict of use because they could have a separate entrance and exit. Um, parking is maybe going to be an issue, but we're not anticipating it as much because we really see the, the driving, um, the increase of, of vehicles being related to staff rather than clientele. Uh, this isn't going to be a high traffic area. Uh, the the use with the, de the developed use with inside is going to be office space, um, light examination area, areas for interviews, things like that. So it's compatible with the building's design. And um, the the lease agreement, I believe, I want to say it was like a dollar a year or mm -hmm. something, very minimal, uh, which was something that we had approached council with. Um, several months ago just to gauge appetite. Um, and everybody's really excited about this project, so we're hopeful that we will move forward on it. Okay, I guess I mean, um, uh, I'll start my, my question and yeah. get you, uh, uh, My one question, I, um, the, the utilities, I don't remember, I know Emily was talking about that last night about with hers. So is the utilities, are we totally, or are, they, are, are these gonna be paid somewhat, ours is totally on us, the utilities? So we've talked about combining the utilities because of common infrastructure. There wouldn't be separate water service or electrical service or internet service like that. Um, but we don't expect much increase in use of the utilities. It would be nominal increase, you know, lighting and, and things like that. They would have their own internet service. Correct. Um, and if they make any modifications to their part of the building that impacts the existing utilities, DPW would sign off on all of that before anything is done. We're, we're, we're heating the space currently. Okay. Um, not to the high standard fully occupied, but clearly do because the utilities and water lines and such has to be, you know, maintained at a, okay. a nominal temperature. But um, this will be a fully built out insulated area, soundproof. They want to make sure it's separated. So, um, again, I would agree that they, they we're talking in terms of utility increases, it would be very minimal. Okay. Joe? Yeah, at our last uh, seniors meeting, again, it was very positive. Uh, all the members on that board said they wanted to do that. It was just one of those things that nobody objected. They thought it was a very positive thing for the community, so. Wonderful. Great. I, I was gonna ask if, what they thought, so that's awesome to hear. And I just wanna say, I, I was looking into it today and I think it's just, Great idea. Just it's so so needed, and I think it's a really great spot too. So I think it's wonderful. That's all. Motion to approve. <laughs> Second. Motion seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay. And that is the Number nine, uh, general ordinance number 21, 23, 24, September 5th, 2023, an ordinance correcting various provisions of the Sheboygan Municipal Code so that they conform to ordinance number 14, 23, 24 on August 7th, 2023. This is just a housekeeping ordinance. With every big ordinance revision, there's always little things that, that you notice after the fact. So this just buttons that up. Questions or discussions on that at all? Make a motion. I move to approve the ordinance. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. That is approved. Okay. Now we're coming to the, the big one. Number 10. Uh, resolution number 36, 23, 24, August 7th, 2023, a resolution adopting the City of Sheboygan Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. Oh, a big one, but <laughs> a subject we all love. Come on. <laughs> we enjoy talking about parks, right? 
<laughs> um, so just a quick background. Um, a comprehensive outdoor recreation plan is basically a five-year plan that most cities should have. And for the reason, we use it as a guide for developing our parks, for preserving our parks, for, for do we need more parks? Um, we use it for a maintenance guide. We use it in a lot of different ways. We use it to find out what people are thinking, what, what, the, what the community needs. Um, we also use it um, to, to pinpoint our current natural resources and our needs of that. So that was that was a big part of this one this time. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and then another large part of a five-year plan um, that's adopted by the council is that you can go out and um, go out for um, federal and state grants and have the eligibility to receive those grants. So um, the big big reason we really put a lot into the um, natural resources this time is we did receive a $25,000 grant from Wisconsin Coastal Management, um, their coastal grant program. So, um, and then it kind of hit at the right time with the with the rising of the, the lake and seeing the destruction along the lake shore. And, and uh, it was just kind of all at a, the, the right time of, hey, we need to include more of this in there. So um, with, the, with receiving the grant and the, the city was, it's a 50-50 matching, so match that grant. Uh, we went out and, and we just finished up working with Grave at um, JC Quarry Park. Um, a large master plan, and we liked working with Graves. So that's where Kristen Sanchez here. She's going to be doing the most of the talking. I'll be done in a second. But um, we hired them um, to go through this process. And the reason we did that this time is, oh, um, three plans ago, it was hired out using consultant, and that's great. Um, we have a large city, and, and I, I think we need that. Um, after that, um, the planning department and myself um, did the did the last one, and uh, that was good. We were able to kind of really use what we we, we did uh, the consultants did before that, and we really it was a goal of David's and ours to mine to to go out and use a consultant again. So um, that's what we did, and um, again, Kristen. She's going to run us through a PowerPoint. I did hand out the sheets for everybody. It is a large, um, large document, but um, I think this sums it up pretty good. And no questions as we go along. So, Kristen, if you want to head us up at the table. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I did bring one hard copy of the plan. Um, and the appendix with that all was that included in the packet, the actual part, the actual plan itself, or just yeah, the PowerPoint? We, we had a couple. If if people need to look at it, I have okay. a, another one here too. If someone wants it, um, we can refer to it if needed as as we go. The PowerPoint is pretty succinct. It's just giving you an overview of the process and the product. Um, so a comprehensive outdoor recreation plan looks at all of the municipal facilities, all of the park facilities in the city. Um, you have 715 acres of parkland in the community, which is a really great number um, and of your parks. So you have 44 municipal parks that were part of this, part of this um, plan. Um, half are on waterfront, which is pretty amazing that you have that resource. Of course, Lake Michigan shoreline is amazing, beautiful resource, um, but you also have parks that are on the Pigeon River and um, on the Sheboygan River. And so all total, it's about half on waterfront and half that, we call, that we're calling inland, just not on water um, in your park system. So what, <clears throat> how did we go about getting from the very beginning to this document? And this is the, pro this is the process, the workflow of it. So we start at the beginning with what we call discovery, but it's really, you know, data collection, but it's also um, going out and talking to, visiting the parks, talking to people, understand kind of what what it, what it is here, what assets and amenities are here. Then we go out and did public engagement. So we did multiple public open houses. We also had like, an, we had an online um, project website. So we have, um, there were, um, you can, there's a survey and a mapping module where people could drag and drop icons and actually leave a comment like, we love this park or this needs improvement here. 
So we had that uh, module that was open as well as other newsletters, posters, flyers, things like that were that were posted throughout the community. Then the next thing is, okay, we understand from an inventory standpoint what's here. We've gone out and talked to the public and we understand kind of what people want and need and think. And then we go and we use a resource called the National Recreation and Park Association, NRPA, and to conduct what's called needs analysis. So it's done a little bit differently now compared to the last time that you guys did a corp um, plan and corpus comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. So love acronyms. Um, so it used to be that there were like they had these standards, so like these ratios. So you know every community needs to have X amount of park per person, X number of acres of park. They really went away from that in the last few years. And it's done with comparable communities or peer communities analysis. So really the needs analysis is very customized to each individual community. There's not a one size fits all for park systems. And so we looked at communities that were similar, right? So kind of same size, same number of parks. And we looked at the kinds of amenities that they had in their system and then kind of did some analysis towards what's existing in Sheboygan and if there is any room for improvement. So is there any place where other comparable communities have a lot of facilities and maybe we lack some facilities. It's just a gauge for us to see as you improve your parks, what facilities might be needed compared to other communities that are similar to, to us, to Sheboygan. So all of that information goes into the middle square, which is creating that vision. Where do we want to be? Now, this is a five-year document. So these aren't 20, 30-year documents necessarily, but there, this is a time we advocate when we do these is that we're creating a vision plan, right? So we're creating a five-year implementation plan, but really looking at where we want to be big picture with the park district and what are the kinds of things we want to do now to set ourselves up for success. So that rolls into a series of recommendations, and then we build the actual uh, plan document, 200 pages of greatness. <laughs> <laughs> So the engagement, we had a really, we had, you know, almost 550 survey responses. You can see, I mentioned that drag and drop, love this park, needs improvement. This is a screenshot of that engagement. You can see we got loads of information and feedback from the community about things. Um, plus we did the survey, so all in, you know, we got a really good kind of snapshot of what people thought from the community. So overall, people love the park system. You guys are doing a lot of things right. Um, they think the parks are well maintained, they have access to parks, um, there's nice facilities in the park. There's a few things that came out in the engagement and really it was um, about trails and connectivity and added trails and paths within the, within the community, not, with, not just within the park, but connecting things together, came out and access to the waterfront. Those were like protect and improve access to the waterfront. So those are some of the key things that we heard. So we talked about this question, park initiatives. And you can see the top vote getting is, you know, maintain the existing beautiful parks that we have. There is, we'll get to the, some of the metrics, but there is robust amount of park, parks and park acreage in the city. So you're not lacking in terms of adding new parks, unless population density grows and changes, right? Where like there's more people living in an area where there weren't before, maybe through redevelopment or growth um, in kind of the edges of the community where new, new subdivisions are built. So but the number two, expand and improve the trail and path system. So that came up again and again in the comments and in the survey questions. So what I found really interesting is when they asked about parks and amenities, oftentimes we hear lots of things about, you know, tennis courts or basketball courts or things like that. Your number one is ice skating. <laughs> and of your top three, two of them are winter activities, sledding and ice skating. And it's really important to think about all seasons. So that gets into kind of this vision framework when you think about what are the goals of the park system. It's really thinking about all seasons um, and not just the summer months when we like to use our parks in the outdoor, you know, in the summer. We want to think year round. So overall, over half of the respondents satisfied with the amount of sports and rec facilities in the parks. And we'll see this, like people are very happy with the park system <laughs> overall. So availability of park shelters and rentals and um, the connections between places and parks, people are generally very, you know, 53, 54% are happy and satisfied with those elements in the park system. So a little bit of the document itself, like putting the document together. So I have a copy here. This is actually in two pieces. Um, 
it's in when it was given to you it's actually one big pdf but we have um the this is the main document and that's from here up so what's included in that piece is which is just kind of sets the stage and introduction. Then we go in and document all of the discovery and engagement that we did, what the community said. Um, we go and look at the, the peer communities, like I said, and explain kind of what some other communities are doing um, and what is the actual inventory that's in the city, the parks, the um, facilities and amenities within each of the parks. From that, we create the vision. Then we go in and explain like what are these opportunities in each of the parks and what are the goals and objectives to get there. Uh, we have a special section, physical <clears throat> characteristics in the Sheboygan's waterfront, that is specifically looking at access to the waterfront and water quality um, and a lot of the sustainability and environmental um, elements of the waterfront park specifically. So 22 of your parks that are on the water. So this chapter focuses in on those. And then the final chapter is implementation and funding. So it outlines what the capital improvement projects that are slated for the next five years, but it also has an action plan matrix. So it takes some of these things that we saw as opportunities, puts it into kind of a, a checklist action plan so that as additional funds or grants become available, that you have a plan of action of things that you can also accomplish over the next few years. That's about 100 pages. And then the appendix is about 100 pages. So the 200 pages overall, but you have 44 parks. The appendix has double page spreads of each of your parks so a map an aerial map on one side and then some data and information on the other side that is what the appendix is so 44 pages times 44 parks times two is 88 pages and then there's some orientation maps at the beginning for your um, all of your parks and your waterfront parks that explains the document i know it's a big document it's a lot of pages so when we look at the inventory this is kind of what i got up earlier alluded to earlier is the inventory itself so um, your metrics. So these are some of the top metrics that NRPA looks at, and that is how many acres of park per resident, number of residents per park. So acres of parks per resident, you want to be high. Numbers of residents per park, you want to be low. You don't want to share your parks with a lot of people, right? And then number of acres per park, how big are your parks? Sheboygan meets or exceeds all of those compared to other comparable communities, according to the data that's collected by the NRPA. Just a quick question. Yeah. Are, are you comparing these this park system as to other communities that are on the lake or anybody with throughout Wisconsin? So we're looking nationally, actually. Okay. So we're looking at um, communities across the country that are similar in size population and have similar size park systems. Okay. And comparing all of the um, these metrics plus some of the amenities and facilities to see how Sheboygan compares. Because yeah, it seemed like we did pretty well. It seems like what? We did pretty well. You did great. <laughs> so this is a little bit kind of deeper dive into some of the facilities and amenities. So overall, people are pretty satisfied. We saw the engagement. So this is a look at, and again, this needs to be customized for each community. This is just data and how you implement it or what's meaningful to you as a, as a community is what's important. But this can be helpful. So anything highlighted in blue is somewhere where either comparable or peer communities that we looked at have more facilities kind of based on, it's a ratio for population, so it's adjusted for population. Um, so those, the blue numbers are the ones where Sheboygan has fewer. So um, for example, basketball courts are your comparable communities adjusted for the size of Sheboygan with just under 50,000 people would have 7.7 which I realize is a 0 0.7 because it's a ratio, it's a number. So it's just, you know, 7.7 .7 basketball courts. You have six and a half. So you're shy about one, right? Is that a lot? Not really, but it's just highlighted here. Maybe you could use another couple half courts somewhere when the opportunity rises. Um, ice rinks at other communities have 3.6. No outdoor ice rinks in Sheboygan. So you see that one. Soccer fields. And then I think the, the racket courts are one that you see that's pretty um, out of kilter compared to some of the comparable communities. You do really you have more of the multi-purpose, the ones that are combined pickleball and tennis. So average communities have like 3.7 of those, you have six of those, so you're up on the up. But overall, just plain tennis courts, another community might have 10. Right now there's zero that are practice or usable or in use um, in the community. Um, and pickleball, just a little shy. 
that pickleball is very popular. They're being built everywhere. And then a comparable community might have a dedicated teen center. And so that's something of note um, also. So again, as, as you look to expand the existing facilities inside or develop or add, this could be a guide to use to say, what are some of the things that we may need more of? So the, our tennis courts, we have six of them, yeah. are all painted for pickleball. Right. That's why they're in a different category. So it's, it's a little, goes a little off there. Does that, excuse me, does that also include the school's tennis courts? And this does not include right. the this school. Is just, so there's other things available yep. to the citizens yep. of it. And that would, right. like their soccer fields and things right. like that, That's too. What I thought, so. Yeah. so these would be facilities that would be open and accessible to the public versus um, so we, we do look at the schools, so they're included in the plan. We understand where they're located and some of the facilities that they have, and they do all the programming, right? Um, so that's part of the plan, but really the plan is focused on how you all as a community want to um, spend or allocate your resources and dollars for the things that you own and control, essentially. That's the focus of the plan. But yes, there are more things in other at the schools also. One of the, one of the difficulties when Yes, they have the facilities, but they're not available at all hours that our park system is available during the day. So like this, during the daytime, you can't go to the school district and play tennis as an adult okay. when school's in session and some of that kind of stuff. And, and there's other restrictions with the school district mm -hmm. that um, also factor in some of these hours. So if you're like younger children, you can't get your kids to play around in the school systems you have now. So all of that information, um, the inventory, comparing us to some other communities and getting engaged for that, and then um, the, the, the engagement all together kind of comes together to create this vision. So we organized the recommendations into these four categories. Um, first, and we heard this again and again in the engagement, it's about trail sidewalks and connection. So it's really important. People are, we see this in communities all over. This isn't unique to hear this. Um, but it did uh, rank really high in the engagement that this was really important um, when asked um, as part of the survey and the engagement. Um, all season amenities, so really thinking about year-round activities in the parks, um, inclusivity and community. So one of the things that we want to be mindful of when we're developing park space and open space in our communities is that it's meant for, for everyone. So whether you're, we have, there's a, there's a saying that uh, whether you're eight or 80, there's a place for you in our parks. And so really thinking about this um, in, in terms of age, ability, um, and what kind of amenities and activities are in the park system. And then finally, facilities maintenance and management. So, you know, there was a high desire for the, the people felt the parks were high quality and wanted to maintain that high quality of the parks. So, not going to go through any of these. I will say <laughs> these are. Um, I was going to mark the page, and then when I got up, I lost. I lost my page where where they are. In there. Um, here we go. Starting on page um, 58 is where you'll find all of these goals and objectives listed throughout the document. But it breaks down those four categories into very specific things, and then action steps that can be taken in order to fulfill those goals and the vision. Mm -hmm. So the facilities, trails and connections, and actually there's a map in the document that highlights some key areas for consideration where future trails and connections can be made. Um, thinking about all season amenities, um, inclusivity, and um, environmental and water quality, which there's a whole chapter, chapter four, that's dedicated to that in the, in the document. So the waterfront itself, I, met, I had mentioned, you know, 22 of your 44 parks are on the water, which is really impressive. And there's a, quite a bit of diversity in terms of the types of spaces that are on your waterfront and including just access to the water views and also just kind of biodiversity and um, different environments to experience in the city, which I think is pretty wonderful. So the waterfront recommendations, which are in chapter four, of this document here. Let me just get to the page so that I can tell you where it is. 66 and 67, this is chapter four. This is a big chapter in there. 
and it has a lot of the goals and objectives for water quality and sustainability. So really improving access, um, thinking about resilience for fluctuations in water levels and the biodiversity and habitat along the water's edge, protecting the water quality, and um, just enhancing the ecosystem. So in this chapter, you'll see as part of it is a really a checklist of sorts which is meant to aid in the discussion of future development in any parks that are on the water. So thinking about things like paving and types of paving, plantings and types of plantings, what kind of active uses would be there, and kind of water and that water's edge, how to treat that and the kinds of things that can be done in order to improve water quality um, within the parks that are on the waterfront. Improve and protect, I should say both, um, um, protect it as it is and improve it. Um, in the future. So as you review park projects and park development projects where you're putting in new facilities, anything that's on the water, you can use this checklist to go and guide some of your decision making going forward. So in the final section of the document is funding and implementation. So in that we have a um, capital improvement plan, which has five projects over the next five years that are already part of the public works budget, but also an, um, an action plan, again, that's a checklist that has some additional things that can be done, as well as some funding sources and grants um, that can be used for the future. So that is the plan. <laughs> 200 pages in a nutshell. <laughs> All right. Anyone have questions, comments, anything, you know? Uh, back in the... When we do a development, it used to be when somebody put a subdivision in, they had used to have that so much area for a park, for money to, is that still there? Is that, because that's not, when I hear about some of the development that's going on, I don't hear, well, and then they're going to put X amount of dollar into the park system. So what we've, what we've, we've done is part of a subdivision plan, we look at the size of the subdivision, look at the area. We look at areas that are conducive to potential park area. But we also, if you recall, we have now a park impact fee that we charge. Okay. So any type of residential development, we collect the fee per housing unit. So if it's a multifamily, we're getting every unit, it pays into the, to same the park with, impact fee. Same with the condo set. Exactly. Very good. Right. So that builds up a, a fund to help develop new amenities or new parks. Gotcha. In fact, I think the most recent one is at the Romer if not Robert Werner subdivision, Stonebrook, Stonebrook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's called Stonebrook, yeah. right between Manning Road and yeah. South Business Drive, that there's a small neighborhood park that's going to be, um, it's platted, it's yeah. part of the subdivision, and in fact, in the capital plan, as you'll see when we start talking about capital improvements, mm -hmm. Wait. there's a update to put a playground and, and develop that. Because okay. I know that was a system, for, and then you ended up with a lot of small, small parks. And then the communities said, we don't want a lot of little parks. Let's well, get that money and then in either reinvest it into the parks that we have or develop larger. Right. Larger so it's parks. it's a balance. So you want to still have neighborhoods so the neighborhood get walkability and mm -hmm. you don't want necessarily people driving to a neighborhood park and utilizing. But you also want more regional, larger for larger groups and larger activities. So there's yeah. the money's still coming. And it's all part of the plan. It identifies those different types of uses and sizes of parks. Was there any um, uh, discussion in all of this about splash pads or pools or things like that? Because so I know that those are really nice amenities. Is that considered? Was that brought up in any of the feedback from the community? So is pools on that list? Or did it's it rank not. at all? It's, it's not, no. Yeah. So you have two with three, three plan. You have two now and a third one planned, right? Plan. So yeah, we um, two weeks old, right? Cleveland two Park weeks. is now getting on a splash pad. So, <laughs> yeah. I approve. Get your dog in there and wash it. Oh, that's it. amazing. <laughs> okay. Two weeks that that, that contract will be committed for you guys to approve. Oh, exciting. Okay, great, great, great. I will say there there was at a our our three meetings, our community meetings, there was probably two that I remember for sure. People talking to us about pools. About pools, yeah. Yeah, and, and and I mean, we had a good discussion, and and I think they understand that uh, pools are very very expensive, and then you have to run them, and you have to operation, and uh, where the city I think made a 
commitment to start going towards splash pads and and we still like to to get one in um uh, you know cleveland's this year still probably open, grand opening next mm -hmm. year and then i think the next one would be pegged for uh, veterans park great and then kiwanis is actually um on the master plan there'd be a, a, a probably a rather larger one Big there one. Yeah. yeah great um uh, what about accessibility for the, the handicap for the lakefront? I know we did have something put in. Is there is that also? Are there going to be more areas like that? Is that in is that in the capital or is that some, or is that would that be something also that would drive our marks way up because it's it's it become more diverse to be able to get to that lakefront? Well, your I mean your marks it would go up in terms of accessibility, inclusivity, um, and the access to the parks. There is um, money in the capital improvement plan currently for ADA accessibility that's in the overall plan that's in the that's in the plan. Um, in terms of waterfront though I'm not sure that it's waterfront specific. More just but, not yeah probably not waterfront specific but just to get all our parks up to um, handicap accessibility um, where they where they should be so and that's there's quite a bit of money set aside each year, all every other year in the capital, but as long as it gets approved every other year to go specifically towards handicap accessibility. If you, you know, we, we did the Moby mat the handicap accessibility on Long Beach. We would probably like to put one at King Park next. Right, that's what, that's and, what you know, saying. that that wouldn't be a capital that we could, you know, right. factor that in our regular operating budget as, okay. as an amenity. But, yeah, as Joe has mentioned, and we have an ADA accessibility plan for the city and parks are a large component of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a multi-year plan where just the bathrooms need to be upgraded. Our, our, our thresholds are just pathways. How do we... I know with the most recent one, we did quite a bit of improvements at Valrath Park uh, for accessibility around the playground and, and some of that. Um, so I think you're gonna—it's a constant need, and we're trying to address it as we can. Yes. So everyone wants an ice skating rink. What? A, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we need winter to come back. Because <laughs> well, and, 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 I—I would think that you would need to almost have a. Well, we, we, yes. we, that would be no. ultimate, yeah, right, is to have, you know, to have the liner system as well as probably, you know, refrigeration. If we're really seriously going to have a, a, a nice public area that is going to be maintained. Um, I, I've dealt a lot with outdoor ice skating rinks and, and since I've been here, it's just, you, you, I, I would guess maybe you'd get a few weeks of good skating but every time it warms up bubbles up and you got to basically start over what about that fake ice stuff like like a plastic yeah I, I haven't checked much into that yet but but what Dean said um, I would say you start with picking one spot it, it's expensive I really looked into it a couple of years ago and, and you put in a chilling system and yeah. a cooler right over I can't describe where it is over by the mm -hmm. um, those uh Kohler has one you know and the Kohler company and highway 23 mm -hmm. it's yeah. private it's private yeah. right? it, it's, it's small it's yeah. yes yeah you gotta um, pay to get in there I mean Sheboygan Falls has two I believe that are open to the public and free for use and no chiller system so the, the, the fact that <laughs> when are they usable I, <laughs> it really depends and and even us being a little closer to the lake is going to make things worse we're trying to keep there should be a community day then at the ice skating rink or something to make it accessible for they, they do have customers. public access yep. at at the blue line um, yeah. as part of their lease they do charge a fee but that's what i'm saying it's not very accessible for a family of four right or so i mean it you know and that's something in terms of if if, if it's really you know it's something to be I guess discuss yeah. about subsidizing yeah. that or Different whatever time, we think. But yeah. Right. But that might satisfy some of that, you know, because right. it is that if you think of ice skating back and you know, it was just what yeah. what it's free and it's anyone can do it and all that, we don't have that. So yeah. Something we to think about. Don't have snow anymore. That's true. But if we did the inside thing, if we did the if but, the inside but place the, had a I, I know blue line is very popular on those open skate uh mm -hmm. nights. 
And again, um, you know, you're right about affordability and how can that be the, the partnership be maximized to have better large, access. Mm -hmm. A large benefactor to, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, the reason I bring it up is because that's uh, when I was speaking to an alter person from Nina, he said that they have a, or because the, the Bergstrom family uh, donated a, for the whole entire thing, you know, we would find someone like that. Maybe that's something we could approach something like an acuity or something like that. Possibly, that's, I guess we have to look at look at those kind of I think avenues. I think as a as a city ourselves, I don't think we can afford to do it for more, you know, more than one. But if mm -hmm. we can find a benefactor to do it, it would be the way to go. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah. All of this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to say I'm, I'm very impressed with this whole study. I think this is really, I think this is really uh, going to be helpful. I, mean, I, I, I think also does this also help with getting grants and yes. things like that. This is you know with having this plan, I think it helps bring you know so that we can get grants to get things that we can't necessarily always afford as a city ourselves. That we can get some of these things to help pay for you know like these splash pads things like that i know that that's you know joe's got a lot of plans for kiwanis and <laughs> <laughs> we hope you know and a lot of plans for jc and so we would like to see those parks do those things so you know to get those grants to get those things bought we, we, we need to get those grants so. yeah this makes us eligible uh there are certain things that uh, state those state and federal grants won't pay for like Usually playgrounds, splash pads, unfortunately. They'll pay for restrooms, parking. So there's a lot they will. Pathways. So there, there's a lot in here that um, um, that we can start reaching out and trying to get some grant money for. And this is good news. Like, this is like a really, like, we scored really high on something. And that's yeah. exciting. I think DPW should look at maybe working with someone to put together some sort of social media. Like, let's, let's sing these praises when we have these really good good reports and yeah, this is great. Congratulations. Awesome. So anyone else have any comments? Then I guess we are looking for a motion for this then. I move to approve the resolution. Second. Okay. Okay, then we also we have we have some cleanup. Liz give us some cleanup for <laughs> sure. so, so this uh, is a two part cleanup. The first relates to language in the original resolution, mm -hmm. which you were suggesting that the language be modified from uh we had misstated that the 2016 plan was the first one and it wasn't so we're just cleaning that up and then the second change is to um, remove or reject the first draft that was referred to the committee from council and instead to accept the current draft that is on today's agenda ideally both would be on the agenda uh, we just have the the, the final one so I've provided Alder Decker with language for that. Okay, so I so I'll read it and then Jenny, you guys can <laughs> then make the motion, I guess. To amend the resolution to modify the first whereas clause to read whereas the city of Sheboygan adopted a five year comprehensive outdoor plan in twenty sixteen and to reject the CORP originally referred to the Public Works Committee and to replace it with the September 6, 2023 version attached to the current Public Works Committee agenda. So who wants to make that motion? I move to adopt the... You move to do that. I move to adopt the... <laughs> do that, okay. I want to second that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first we need to vote up. Uh, if there's any discussion on that, okay, then first we have to vote on the, the amendment. Aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed? Chair votes aye. That approved. Now we get to vote on the uh, resolution as amended. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. That approved. I think that puts us through, right? <laughs> okay. We're good. <laughs> We're good. Okay. Uh, next meeting date is September 26, 2023. Seems to be exhausted. Yeah, anyone? Motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>